Shishin, uh, literary director of Omsk's Fifth Theater. So I'll begin by asking Dave, we had a fantastic uh, uh, talk back last night, which centered around uh, Dave's essay, uh, Adam Smashing Playwright. Um, and that was about the works of Claude Giff. And I, I wanted, Dave, would you favor us with uh, a few points from that essay? Sure. Um, you know, one, one of the things after, uh, I, I first encountered Yuri Klavdiev in 2008 in Slovakia uh, when I was, where I was at a festival. John Friedman had curated the Focus Russia portion of the Nova Drama Festival that was there. And I walked into a theater not knowing what I was going to see. I didn't speak a lick of Russian. Uh, and I saw a production of I Am the Machine Gunner and was absolutely floored by this work. Um, Kind of the same way where you know you may be able to listen to John Coltrane, but the first time you ever heard him, and totally superseded all language. And it was one of the first experiences of my life when I realized that theater can live in another level beyond understanding. And um, so that night, I talked to John a little bit about the piece, and I said, I think I know what this play is about, but I don't know. Can you tell me about it? And John said, well, you want to see a translation? And a week later, we had one. And a week after that, we went into rehearsals. Uh, so, so it was a really exciting journey. And, and on that journey, I've encountered a lot of Klav Diev's work. And, and what I realized in looking at them, one of the commonalities of them um, goes to the word badass. Um, and, and when I say that, I'm not necessarily just talking about the attitude of the work, its uncompromising nature. But I'm talking about the idea of two words being slammed together to create another word. And I find that Klavdiev's work, Klavdiev, what he's doing across many, if not most, if not all of his pieces, is taking two diverse genres and smashing them together to come up with a new way of telling a story. His words really, his plays really defy simple descriptions, right? I would say I Am the Machine Gunner is kind of like Grand Theft Auto meets Saving Private Ryan, right? Uh, martial Arts is kind of Bridge to Terabethia meets Pulp Fiction. So, you know, he's taking these things that we know, childhood and, and drug dealing, and smashing them together in this way that kind of creates a fantastical reality that really drags us in as audience members. So, so that's a little bit of kind of what I've observed. And if you go through his docudrama, uh, The Polar Truth, you wind up seeing him kind of smashing docudrama up against some very rich storytelling and, and, and how he b managed to capture the, the milieu of, of people with HIV within that play. Uh, and, and capturing that with real tenderness uh, as well as real rebellion. And so kind of as I think about Claude Diev's work, I really do consider him to be uh, an atom-smashing playwright where it is these two things coming together. And, and it's, it's uh, we coined the term while we were working on Machine Gunner of the aesthetics of badass. And in some ways I feel like Claude Diev is really kind of working within that kind of uncompromising, intimidating work that is intimidating not just for you out there as audience members, but also as an artist beginning to tackle it. Um, he leaves so much freedom within this work. Uh, I'm the Machine Gunner is one block of text, and Graham figured out, okay, this is who's speaking when, and you know, it, he leaves that up to you, which requires, as an artist, a hell of a lot of effort, because he's not giving it to you. We're really used to, in American theater, I think, having things prescribed to us, and Klavdiev gives you these very loose blueprints, and, and I've seen productions of I Am the Machine Gunner that are one person. I was in Moscow and went to see a production that was nine people. Um, so it can really be blown apart in all of these different that ways. That would have been helpful. Right. <laughs> eight, eight other people. <laughs> so, yeah. When you were figuring out all those things. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that's a few thoughts kind of on, on Yuri Klavdiev and, and kind of the, the milieu that I see him working out of in, in a kind of an overview of his work. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dave. And uh, something that you'd mentioned about um, the different productions that have gone on in Moscow of Klavdiev's work, it seems like uh, Masha, this might be something you could speak to. Um, yeah. I think uh, several productions that were done uh, with his play Razvalin. Uh, and uh, I've been at the reading at Lubinsky Festival uh, when the first uh, the martial arts were read, and it was when it was read first time, and we're going through all this uh, like world that he creates and this kind of mystery and all this uh, city folk, childish city folk that is uh, used there. Uh, you kind of how you can make it on the stage. Uh, and uh, what we've seen here uh, in both productions, in the Iron Machine Gunner and uh, the Martial Arts, 
it's the brilliant piece of art and uh, n not in uh, any uh, US place, theater, you can find such a uh, great work. And I, I want to congratulate Austin and the Breaking String and the Salvage Vanguard with that uh, we seen here and that it, it all happened. And first of all, thanks to you, Graham, that you had the courage to do that. Uh, and I hope that uh, some people who I hope seen that through the uh, webcast or maybe in Russia and some other places also appreciated it a lot. And I think that the uh, I'm the Machine Gunner is the really brilliant piece of theater uh, and acting and design and just congratulations. Um, mm -hmm. What I love about Bureaucrasis is that he's controversial. He's not very um, easy one uh, to do uh, and to work within the theatrical space and uh, you need to think a lot. And I know that when we've been together in uh, Moscow and we've seen the slow sword and when you were thinking about just doing the slow sword here, you decided not to do that. Uh, so it is not easy to work with Slavodiv because he creates his own world. He has uh, his own mythology uh, which he invents and builds and each and every uh, piece that he creates, he has his own mythology in. And I think that is uh, his unique character. Maybe John will correct me, but I think no, so, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you, Masha. And we'll, we'll have, a, have a chance to return to some of these points. We're trying to get some of the ideas on the table, so thanks for starting us out. Pavel, um, I wanted to turn to you. You're from Omsk, which is uh, a several hour plane flight from Moscow um, out in Siberia. And I'm curious if you might talk some about uh, new Russian drama, or, or now I suppose it would be contemporary Russian drama, in, in the provinces. How is it experienced? Um, because a lot of it comes from the provinces, I understand. I mean, might you speak to that point? Uh, so, uh, I think uh, that here in Austin you've got more Russian, new con contemporary Russian drama than in provincial <laughs> Russia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that's, tr that's truly exactly because I, uh, I travel quite a lot in Russia because I'm um, programming a theater festival which is held in Oms. So this is why I'm trying to see as much po uh, uh, as many productions as possible, especially in the provinces, not in Moscow. And I should say that Moscow is very different from uh, the other s parts of Russia, even from Saint Petersburg in a way. And uh, for me, I uh, I should admit, well, although I am ashamed to admit, but uh, I've seen these two productions. Uh, productions of these two plays for the first time here in Austin. I am the machine gunner, so it's my first time on a sitting stage in martial arts as well. Although, uh, uh, so uh, new Russian drama, contemporary Russian drama and contemporary Russian playwrights are not very popular outside of, of Moscow, unfortunately. And uh, there are very many state-owned theatre companies in Russia and about 400 theatres in the in the whole country and I think you can well there are only about 10 10 or 20 companies who stage can in every playwrights and mm, so I, 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 I don't know why maybe maybe maybe, it, uh, maybe this is because of the uncomfortable nature of this playwriting because it deals with the issues that we Russians, especially far from Moscow, are not ready to face or trying to avoid somehow. And although this, as far as I see it, uh, this, uh, this, is the, the, this, this concept is going away now because theater people believe that Russian audience do not need contemporary playwriting. And what what we do uh, in a laboratory format as uh, when we present contemporary plays as staged readings, something, they attract lots of audience, 
uh, in provinces in Omsk, Novosibirsk, uh, Krasnoyarsk, and uh, uh, I uh, I think that uh, it will change. In well, maybe not in the nearest future, but maybe in five years' time. It will change, and there will appear more and more uh, uh, pr productions based on contemporary playwriting. And I would, uh, I would like to, s to mention uh, what, 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 what I call St. Peter, uh, uh, Petersburg anomaly in our uh, uh, well, s because St. Petersburg was as much, uh, as much a provincial city as Omsk is now, <laughs> I should say, uh, uh, theater-wise, I mean. Uh, the repertoire there's was obviously quite there's traditional. There's yeah. obviously nobody from St. Petersburg here, because if there was, they would have been throwing things at him. <laughs> 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 well, but he's right. <laughs> anyway, uh, anyway uh, w when you think, uh, w uh, well, two years ago, say, when you, uh, when you were talking about St. Petersburg and about uh, r the repertoire of theaters in St. Petersburg, it was quite traditional, some uh, light comedies or Russian classics, so 150 versions of Chekhov's Seagull in every, th <laughs> in, in every <laughs> theater, so that, and that would be the repertoire of uh, St. Petersburg theater. But nowadays, uh, things are different and there are lots of young theater companies appearing in St. Petersburg, especially Etude Theater uh, or On Theater, Laboratory On Theater. And they produce uh, shows based on contemporary playwriting only. And Klavdiev, who lives in St. Petersburg, but uh, well now uh, appears on stage there, and there is a a great production, I would say, of uh, uh, of Razvalini. Masha mentioned that the Razvalini, uh, uh, it's um, uh, it it uh, it translated into English, it means the ruins. It it is the last name of a family, actually, and it ta uh, and it tackles with even more uncomfortable issues than I'm the machine gunner, probably. It is a, it it deals with the issue of cannibalism during the Second World War and the siege of Saint of Leningrad then. So, you, you know, and some I, it is a shocking play, but it is somehow, uh, it is a very, a very uh, it, it, first of all, it is a very good production of it. Uh, of it. And uh, it is very popular in St. Petersburg now. You can't buy tickets for that show. You should buy them well, uh, a month in advance, at least, to, in order to get to that show, you know. So, uh, St. Petersburg, mm, un un unlike, unlike Moscow, is a very conservative city, but uh, I think that uh, St. Petersburg will be an example for Omsk or Yekaterinburg, in a way, of uh, Novosibirsk, and uh, new contemporary Russian drama will appear there as well. So I, f I hope so. So I think that there are very many, very many good playwrights uh, nowadays in Russia. Ver uh, well, quite a quite number of them. But they belong to small spaces, only somewhere in Moscow and even smaller spaces in St. Petersburg. But, well, uh, let's meet here in five year time. And <laughs> 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 Something has changed by then. Thank you so much, Pavel, uh, for giving us kind of a global uh, view of uh, Russia in its entirety, all 11 of her time zones, and um, <laughs> new Russian drama's place in it. Uh, I wonder if we might zero in on Moscow, since we have uh, a gentleman here who's, who's, who's absolutely immersed in that particular scene, John, who several hundred productions a year. Uh, and a couple others. I want to. I want to. Uh, I want to swing uh, out first before I come back to Moscow, uh, because w an interesting thing. Uh, Pavel lives in Omsk. Uh, he's actually from Yekaterinburg, and uh, it's it's really important to say that another real center for playwriting is in the city of Yekaterinburg, uh, in Pavel's uh, hometown, where in fact you can see lots of contemporary plays because there is a, a playwright by the name of Nikolai Kalyada who has his own theater, who teaches playwriting there, and who does a lot of productions of contemporary plays, um, and uh, takes some of them on tour from time to time. 
But um, the only other city really in the last 10, well, yeah, 10, 15, 20 years that has really had a concentrated number of writers uh, outside of Moscow, new writers outside of Moscow has been Kalyati, which is where Klavdiev is from. If any of you were here at the reading today of Trash, uh, the author of that play is also from Kalyati. Um, but the interesting thing there <laughs> is if Kalyada stays in Yekaterinburg and writes his plays and stages his plays, and most of Kalyada's students stay in Yekaterinburg and write their plays there, uh, Vasily Sigarev, Oleg Bagaev, Yaroslav Apulinovich, I, I realize that's alphabet soup, but those, those are all really big names in, in, in Russian drama, very big names in contemporary Russian drama. All of them have stayed in Yekaterinburg and continue to build and develop uh, the art form in that city. Uh, Taliati, which uh, produced several uh, uh, really fine writers, Klavdiev, uh, two Durinikov brothers, uh, a guy by the name of Vadim Ivanov, um, it did not hold uh, as, a, as a unique place that was capable of developing a school over a period of time. Uh, Klavdiev ended up going to St. Petersburg uh, as uh, Pasha pointed out, Misha Durnikov moved to Moscow. Vadim Livanov unfortunately died of cancer uh, as a very young man, 44 years old, uh, a year, a little over a year ago. And so there's just one of the major writers left there in Taliati. So Taliati never really, it, it's a major city. It, may, it produced several major writers, but it is not going to do that anymore. That's that, the Taliati, Taliati phenomenon, as it was called, is, is now over. It's, it's a, a part of history. Moscow tends to suck things in and, and, and bring people to it. Um, there's lots of examples. I mean, there's, a, there's again, I, I, I hesitate to throw uh, alphabet soup at you, but believe me, we're talking about major writers when I say someone like Mikhail Ugarov, uh, who founded Theater Doc and has, uh, is a guru of contemporary Russian drama. Uh, Misha Ugarov is not from Moscow, he's from Arkhangelsk. Uh, Maxim Kurichkin, whom many of you know personally because Max has been here twice. Maxim Kurichkin is not from Moscow. He's from Kiev. He comes to Moscow. And so Moscow is a place that, that gathers, that attracts like a magnet and provides opportunities for people to stay, grow, and produce new work. And of course, the, the variety of things being done in Moscow is enormous. And if we talk about Klavdiev and we talk about Kurichkin, or if we talk about Olga Muhina, again, whom many of you may know because she was produced here two years ago, Graham staged uh, her play uh, Flying, uh, which I want to point out is just out as a, as a movie. Uh, came out uh, about 15 days ago. Flying mm -hmm. came out as, uh, uh, as a movie in Russia. Um, and uh, uh, these are all, and, and uh, Muhina was also, she was actually born in Moscow, but she grew up outside of Moscow and returned. Um, these are all very different writers, and Moscow is more than capable of having room for these people and giving them an opportunity to develop each in their own way. So the, the atmosphere there in the, the playwriting community is really extremely varied. And uh, indeed, I'll just, I will just support what Pasha said. Literally in the last two years, St. Petersburg has gone from being a zero on the map of contemporary writing to on a scale of 10 to maybe five or six already. I mean, you know, a huge leap, thanks to this theater called On Theater, uh, which has really invigorated the city and has created an interest in new plays uh, and uh, is going to continue, I'm sure, uh, doing so. So it's a, one last thing. Um, uh, I would say that we are at a at a, at a turning point in contemporary Russian drama because the writers who showed up began creating new styles, uh, giving us new names, giving us new kinds of works. That is Maxim Kurichkin, that is Yuri Klavdiev, uh, and, and, and the like. They are now, if you will, masters. They are now major writers. They are established writers. We know them, we trust them. Uh, we can trust them. We know that they're going to give us quality. We know what kind of quality that is. We know what kind of style it is. And their uh, uh, authority now is such that it's much harder for, for younger writers coming up uh, behind them 
Uh, many of the younger writers for the last couple of years have looked like they are epigones. They have looked like they're copying. They look. They they look have looked like they're using the the models of the, these writers who we can now call masters. And it's 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 been pretty hard for them to break through. I think we're beginning to see, to see a few signs of a, another generation pushing up through. And indeed, uh, maybe not even five years from now. Maybe Pasha will have to come back in five years for the provinces to catch up, but I think maybe in three years in Moscow we may see we may see you know a, a whole other generation coming up pushing up under uh, uh, Kurochkin, Klaviev, and the likes. It was absolutely wonderful. I wonder if I might elicit uh, reactions or reflections to some of these thoughts from the audience. Yes, sir. Yeah, so I'm going to explode my ignorance. That's a good thing. To <laughs> <laughs> so. makes it so controversial? Uh, I think those are pretty easy to answer. What makes it so controversial is, is, is incredible violence, uh, cannibalism, uh, the, the ruins, the play The Ruins is, uh, was pretty shocking. Oh, uh, uh, I'm sorry? Monotheist. The monotheist. Extremely violent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, what you saw here yeah. tonight is, is challenging. It's in your face. You know? mm -hmm. it's, uh, I think that's an easy one to answer. How, uh, how, what's the word you use? How characteristic? Repre uh, uh, yeah, um, uh, representative. Um, well, in the sense that he's pushing envelopes, in the sense that he's pushing an audience to, to go beyond their, their usual comfort zone, I think he's, I think all of the writers that we're talking about in this, in this generation all try to do that in very different ways. Kurochkin tends to do that more intellectually, uh, stylistically. Uh, confusing the audience, throwing you know, throwing them red herrings one after another, you know, sh sending people off on wild goose chases, all kinds of stuff. You know, that's that's all a matter. Whereas, whereas with with Klavdiev, it's like he's just coming right at you, like Joey Hood, you know, just comes right up to us and just like you know, that's that is Klavdiev coming right at you. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just social themes; it's also because it seems to me, again, as a total amateur, that Russians tend to worship their classics, right? Like Chekhov, like you said, right? So is it also, I guess, social in terms of not just rejecting the old way of writing plays or, you know, like Chekhov or anything? Because like, for example, you said in the St. Petersburg there were 150 productions of Chekhov. That means that there's- Well, a not 150, no, 75. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> right, that, that means that there's that much demand for that kind of stuff, right? And so, by presenting, say, the ugly side of contemporary Russian society. Is that by itself controversial? Do you want to take that, Masha? Uh, in a way, yes, uh, because uh, what uh, was called the new drama uh, was formed as an answer uh, to the completely becoming artificial theater which sticked uh, to the classical authors and uh, the young generation f failed to believe in that and uh, just had no uh, sense in what was happening on the stage and they wanted to do something that they're really feeling true and right and appealing. Uh, and what is important about uh, Klavdiev is that uh, the sense of uh, the provincial taliati, the sense of this uh, time um, between uh, 90s and uh, 2000s, uh, and the uh, <coughs> amount of events and violence and destruction and blood, uh, what was happening in the country and in Taliati in particular because of like businesses, crimes and um, guns and shooting in the streets. Uh, it was happening uh, and uh, there were no uh, articulation for that in the theater, in the art at all. And he just find the way uh, to speak about what was bothering him. And it was kind of kind of sincere way to do that. And that is, I believe, where his 
uniqueness is. Are there any productions of this with actual children playing their children? I mean, uh, would that be possible? The, m uh, the martial arts uh, yeah. had never been produced in Russia. There were only one reading during the festival of uh, young uh, playwriting, young drummer, Lubimov Kowain. The world premiere of that display took place in Baltimore at Towson University uh, year, two years ago? Mm -hmm. Three. Three, already three years ago. Three years ago, um, <laughs> it was staged by Yuri Urunov, mm -hmm. and the second production in the history of the world. Just we just watched. It. So in the <laughs> in the uh, like middle of nineties, when uh, this uh, new drama trend started uh, to be formed, there were uh, several ma major centers. It was Moscow, it was Yekaterinburg, and it was Tolyati when uh, Vadim Livanov. Uh, major playwright started gathering people around himself doing the festival, doing readings, bringing people from Moscow uh, and from other places to read the place and to create some uh, vibe around that. Uh, and so uh, appeared Durinkov Brothers, uh, Klavdiev, uh, Kira Malinina and s some other authors uh, who went. Uh, Kira now lives in Ukraine, Misha in Moscow, you're in uh, St. Petersburg. Uh, Slava Durninkov stayed in Taliati and he's doing some uh, social work there and still writing, I believe. Mm. Uh, and uh, what we're now witnessing is that this uh, centers of like why playwriting life is a bit switching, changing. Moscow uh, stays as a more political and now uh, more socially engaged. Uh, young writers are uh, more willingly participate in the social project in the applied theater, they, uh, what the theater dog does, uh, or they try to find the new forms uh, and uh, like do adaptations of the classics, uh, what the Ugarov does with the center of drama and playwriting. Uh, Yekaterin book uh, encapsulated uh, what they were doing, uh, their trends and their uh, mythology, their own mythology, o also very dark one uh, about apocalypse. Uh, it was like believed that they are knowing about that a lot and they are writing about that, the Sigurev, the Bagaev, uh, and uh, Yaroslav Polinovich appeared like a very, very young voice and she is very uh, popular now in Russia and she staged all over the country in Yaroslav, in so, so many different provincial uh, theaters, uh, and that is uh, like in the contrary of what uh, Pasha told. So some playwrights, they are popular even in the province uh, because even in the provincial cities uh, where uh, a new director came to the theater and he wants to change something, first thing that he tries to do is the new drama uh, because it's like very, very near to what people think, people feel, what are on the tips of fingers. And yes, and now uh, the, uh, during the uh, like uh, past uh, maybe two Lubimovka festivals, we're witnessing that there are appearing a uh, very interesting uh, center in Minsk, for example, in Belarusia. Uh, some playwrights are coming from there. They're writing in Russian, they're kind of Russian language playwrights and they're coming to Moscow because Moscow becoming a gate to any other theaters around the country and uh, they can get uh, their uh, place to be read, to be heard, and then maybe get some future for like stagings. I ask, uh, Dave, you were nodding your head. You have yeah, well, uh, as an American going over to something, I, th there, there's a couple of things that I found really interesting in kind of the controversy and the things you're asking about this. Uh, I, I, I had the great pleasure of going to Lubimovka, which is the Young Playwrights Festival where, where martial arts had its reading, and, and saw something that I never see in the U.S., which was in a room half this size, 120 people squeezing in, people propped up in windowsills to hear readings of plays, people crammed out doorways to the point where I had a colleague that was like, I'm claustrophobic, I get out of here, <laughs> right? Um, and, and there's this huge hunger for this writing among young people. Uh, that, that, that I found remarkably encouraging. Mm -hmm. So, but, but as, as Pavel was bringing up, right, who, who's gonna pay the ticket price to come see the productions? And 
when we get into controversy, there was one thing that happened, correct me if my memory of this is wrong, but a number of these writers started writing for TV and started putting some of these issues into television episodes. And there was a television show, I believe, called Schola that came School. out. Schola, which school? School. 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 Yeah. Right? And when I was just translating your good Russian. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. That's my job here. I, I love it. I love it. Uh, and when that came out and these things were put on TV, because TV is that much more impactful, uh, the series was, I think, wasn't it put on hold for a while or wasn't it canceled? Because this shouldn't be going to the mass. It's okay in the theater. Well, that's, that's great. It's, uh, there was, there's actually yeah. one audience member that had a really powerful reaction. I got a chance to speak to, and I wanted to uh, ask him to uh, share his thoughts and experiences. That's Johnny Meyer. Johnny is a, a, a veteran of uh, the, the, the war in Afghanistan. He had a particularly powerful experience um, watching uh, I Am the Machine Gunner. I wonder, Johnny, if you might talk yeah. a bit about that. Well, first, I just want to say thanks for everybody for, for coming out. It's great to um, all the great institutional support and work that goes into bringing this to Austin, so thank you for that. And I, yeah, I am a machine gunner, I, and uh, both plays had a powerful effect on me, and, and uh, they, they're just beautifully, beautifully done, so congratulations to you all now. But I guess the effect that I had with uh, I am a machine gunner was that, um, you know, for many of us, uh, as, uh, as uh, Mr. White mentioned over the, over the break, I think, that uh, many of us have grandparents that were in World War II as well. And I, I, my, I myself lost uh, my grandfather, uh, last veteran in my family besides me, uh, just passed away over Christmas. And what was sh shocking and amazing about I'm the Machine Gunner is that here is an instance of uh, a grandfather that's a veteran whose experience was so horrifying and so entrapping that the pathos of violence committed him, uh, not only him, but his grandson and subsequent generations into that the, uh, sort of uh, psychology of violence, trapped into those mechanisms uh, that uh, Joey gave us tonight in those two characters. And it was an extraordinary thing to see and hear, and it was wonderful to watch the narrative break, uh, and <laughs> us as human beings, of course, are uh, trying to put it back together again, I'm sure we all did, uh, flaw <laughs> flawlessly. Um, but <laughs> it, was, uh, it was extraordinary to watch that art um, come at us and, and, uh, and see what we do with it and what happens and what, how, how the trap that's the set for, the, for both the characters and Joey was in it. That was extraordinary. So I just thanks to everybody for what an amazing, amazing thing to know that somebody's writing like that. It's one of those things where I, I as a playwright myself, uh, you don't want to write something like that. You're just goddamn glad somebody did. <laughs> 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 you realize that that's going to get quoted that's many, great. many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so amazing. You, it, I mean, thank God. It's the kind of thing, it had an Iliad-like uh, song of and we, the, the hubris and the honor and the difference between the two and how they cross over. What, what's the difference between honoring the grandfather and catch, catching on to the hubris that inevitably was there? And God, think of the, the, you can't help but think, what was it like uh, for the wife, the grandmother, who had to live with that? Or children, or to your character, for me, the film there. It was gorgeous. What a gorgeous piece of work. And both both sides were like that. I had a powerful experience to the other one, too. Um, but I think that it, I just had to speak about that one. I'm sorry for talking for so long. This is great. It, um, it's not great. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank, 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 thank you, you too, Johnny. Thank you. I'm sorry. I have to take my leave. Uh, but no, thank thanks. you for your reaction. Great thank work. You for, for saying so. Great work, Johnny. And yeah. thank you all for being here. <laughs> Love you all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, I think we have uh, time for one more question in this formal, structured atmosphere, and we will transition into the lobby where we can continue, continue discussion. Uh, uh, yes, uh, we'll, we'll go one, two. I said one question, <laughs> and then two. So uh, uh, quickly, yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, Tanya, yes. Yeah.
uh, of, of, uh, of immigration, uh, of right. people so, living so in immigration. Speaking playwrights who live in the United States or in other countries. Uh, the, the short answer to that, Tanya, is no. Um, and that's also a historical answer, largely, as you, as you probably know. The writers that left after the revolution, uh, by and large, rarely did their best work. Nabokov is an extremely, uh, is an extreme uh, ex uh, exception. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, the vast majority of writers who emigrated then and now uh, tend not to do their best work after emigration. Playwrights specifically must be in the language. They must be in the culture. Without that, it's, it's virtually impossible to write a good play. And so you get very, very, very few playwrights working in immigration. There were a few at, in, the, in the 20s, the teens, 20s, 30s, a very few, um, none of which have ever had any real impact. Uh, and so I, um, I feel very safe in saying that there is no one of importance doing it now. Be happy to pro be proved wrong, mm -hmm. but at this point, I think that's mm -hmm. a pretty clear answer. Thanks, John. And then Chris, you had a question? Yeah. Um, so many of these, these new playwrights are, are immigrants, and they're coming to America and they're Dominate. You want one of you guys want to take that? You don't want to take that? <laughs> um, uh, well, I, I, I understand why she doesn't I, want to. I, I can, but uh, I'm not as much um, in the material as, as you, for example. I know s some uh, projects that are happening, and I know the position of uh, Yelena Anatolyevna Gremina and Mikhail uh, Ugarov, uh, who are running the theatre doc, and that what they are doing and how they. Um, adjust themselves within their reality and political reality. Uh, they are doing, uh, already done the two productions about the Ma Magnitsky death, uh, and it's a uh, quite straightforward thing. Uh, it's a kind of, it's not a court session, but it's a kind of uh, artificial uh, way of telling what these uh, murderers will get after they die. <laughs> Um, in a way, uh, but revealing the actual facts of the, uh, facts of the case and uh, actual names and um, I interviews. It's very documentary based. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, they get the government money and they do social projects uh, uh, on them uh, and they go for schools and they do theatrical adaptations of classics and so they kind of find their balance uh, to uh, save their artistic freedom uh, and do uh, right things anyway. Hmm. Uh, very briefly, Please. kind of a coda. Uh, yeah. I'll just say that your, your, your question, Chris, mm -hmm. in, uh, in a sense, presumes that it's kind of monolithic. You say, will they want to preserve, preserve their freedom? But all of these writers are all very different. They're all very, they're all individual. Uh, you have Nikolai Kalyada in Yekaterinburg actively supporting Putin and his policies. You have Gremina uh, in, in Moscow actively opposing uh, Putin's policies. You have Yuri Klavdiev <laughs> in St. Petersburg who is politically, is kind of like all over the place. He's a, you know, a, a, if we talk about him politically, he's a very difficult figure to, to, to pin down. So it's, um, it's the answer, the reason that nobody wanted to answer your question, myself included, is because it would take an, it would take an entire history book. Yeah, that's a really big question, which is, you know. 
or so dance full diversity of <coughs> different points. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, then there's lots of time to talk about it. I love it, so let's do it. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Fucking great, congratulations. That was really good.